Hi everyone, this is Richard. In these series of videos, we're going to go over Flutter. Um, now Flutter is a framework for the Dart language and it's intended for development on mobile devices like your smartphones, tablets, that type of setup. So this video itself, we're just going to talk a little bit about the background, what's been going on with Flutter and with Dart, what the heck it is. Um, in the next video, we'll go over the setup itself and hopefully go from there. All right. So just as a background, I'm just a beginner here. I don't even know Flutter at all. I've been struggling to set this thing, thing up the whole time. So I don't know the first thing about it. Well, I know a little bit about it, but not a lot. And so in all these series of videos are is my documenting my approach to how I am actually learning these things as it has, has been for all my other videos. So I'm going to start from the beginning and just think that we don't know anything about Flutter IO. We're going to probably uh, assume that you know at least Dart. If you don't at all any programming, uh, you might want to go to my previous videos if you're completely new to programming. Um, and then I did do a few videos on web programming as well. So just be a little bit familiar with Dart language in and of itself as well as web programming. So what Flutter um, is, it's the www.flutter.io. Um, what Flutter is, it's a framework for development, like I said, on mobile platforms. If we back up a little bit and say, well, what has been going on with Dart this whole time? Because it's very interesting to see the evolution of Dart. When it first came out, it was a web language. That was the purpose of it. It was intended to be both a client and server-side web language. Okay, so making... Um, server-side framework, well, there's no great server-side framework, no set server-side framework, but um, it's relatively easy to make those. I still have to go through that, but uh, maybe that's another time. Um, and then client-side also, making, you know, using a framework like Angular, um, you can make some web applications, and that's perfectly great. But the problem with it is as the years went by, mobile devices became a lot more prominent. So for desktop, that's great. For mobile devices, not so much so. Specifically, the barrier was iOS. In iOS, their rules basically say is you cannot have a um, virtual machine running your applications on this platform. That's just the way the rules were. So when people wanted to make applications for mobile devices, they had to use Java for Android, Objective-C or Swift for iOS. And those were the languages of choice. So there was a potential opportunity here in terms of what are we going to do and make this a little bit easier. So instead of writing something in Java, then rewriting it in either Objective-C or uh, uh, Swift, um, what, what, what are we going to actually do right there? So some people at Google came together and basically developed the Flutter framework so that you could develop one code base and deploy it both on Android and iOS. Now, when we back up and remember what Dart language is about, it uses a JIT, right? Just in time compiler. And the, the benefit was that was you just have a, a, a JIT either, well, mostly in the web browser, all right, or you compiled it into JavaScript and then the JavaScript had a um, JIT and then you ran the code in the browser source code and you ran it and it converted to machine code on the fly. So the runtime and the compile time was basically the same thing, right? Well, yes, but then um, that was in the very beginning of Dart when they had Dartium. So Dartium was you have a browser, but you have the Dart virtual machine inside of there. Then they changed the the course of things and they said, well, wait a minute, I don't think that this is going to be the way to go. So they removed Dartium or they stopped pursuing that pathway and they instead started saying, well, let's just focus on compiling it, everything into JavaScript and we'll focus on that. So we got the source code, we compiled it into JavaScript and we could catch any errors at compile time that we potentially could find. And then we would you know, get that JavaScript and run it through the JIT and it would be converted to machine code on the fly as you run it, right? And as long as you have this virtual machine running, the code can run it. So it would run in a browser. If you ran it on a server, you just have to install the VM on your computer in order to have it run. Great, all right? Um, that's a little different from um, AOT or ahead of time compilation. So ahead of time compilation basically says you get your code and you compile it and you turn it usually into some binary. Um, 
if you remember a video way, way, way back in the very beginning, Binear is what you actually use to, act, to run um, and run the code. You just run it directly. The, but the problem with an AOT um, code or language is you get the compiled code and it has to be targeted to a specific platform. So if I get this code, I send it through the compiler, I have to target this, this or this or this. So if you compiled your code for, for example, a desktop setup like uh, Windows, you can't just run it automatically on a Mac. You can't just set it or run it on something else. You have to set certain parameters so that the, the setup in and of itself, you have to compile it to that platform. And it can be very difficult to do if you have lots of different platforms. So this is another problem here as well. So how do we actually do this and we get some code and we run it on different platforms and that was the real problem? Well, um, what you could do is, of course, get some commonalities, something that's in, run in common with some of these things, mostly these two, two platforms, and you abstract it out. And then when you run the code, it runs through an ab abstraction type of process. And so that the comp when you compile it, it could compile either to this or to this. Of course, that binary will not, not run on this and this. You have to get the source code and compile to this. Then you get the source code and you compile to this. So you can always do that, but you don't have to at least rewrite the code over again. All right. So the problem with this is that you can't just get a JIT language and then automatically change it to AOT. All right. It just, just doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is that there's a lot of different changes that have to go on, a lot of different assumptions. And this is way above my head in terms of what those actual changes needed to be. But the Dart 1.0 and above, less than 2.0, didn't have that capability. It was not intended to be that. It was intended to be a JIT. All right. So what they did is they changed the language as it evolved. They changed it. And, and one of the changes they made was strong mode. And what strong mode basically is, if we remember Dart, it's an optionally typed language. So you can either declare the types or you can not declare the types. So it's you can use dynamic typing or static typing, which is not that important for a JIT. It's very important for AOT. Okay. Um, this using the strong mode makes typing a lot more pre pre predictable and specific. And one of the big things that it uses is, among many other things, it's type inference. So I don't remember if I've gone over type inference before. I think I did, but that was probably a couple years ago. What? Here's an example of type type inference. Okay. So void main. I'm just going to say var a equals one. So the if you send it through the VM, basically, it's going to say, oh, the variable A is an int, right? It's going to be an int right inside of here. So I got that now. But if I say A equals high, it's going to say, oh, wait a minute. This is supposed to be an int. Now it's a string. What's going on with that? And so it gives you an error. String can't be assigned to variable type int. Even though I didn't put int here, that's type inference. It's inferring that this is an int just because that's what you did right here. Okay. And then, but if you print a, it's still going to work, but it's still going to give you an error. Okay. So if we did not strong mode, I don't know if you can see that strong mode. What's this? If you unclick that, this error goes away because here, the original non strong mode, there is no type inference. It doesn't say you have no qualifications for a a is a variable you can do whatever you want with it but if you if you put type inference use the, the strong mode then it's going to say this is wrong right inside of here and in strong mode actually and dart 2.0 this actually won't run it'll be an outright error and you have to stop right there and you have to fix it you can either put an int here or you have to make a new variable right inside of here all right so that's one of the uh, things about Dart, which I, I personally like, I like when you're very specific, it does exactly what you want it to do, not more and not less. Specifically not more, because if you have the, the VM do too much for you, many times it's unpredictable. Sometimes you think it'll do this, sometimes not, and it's very unclear. All right. So that's where Dart 2.0 is headed um, in order. The purpose of it is to not just make it more predictable and specific, but specifically to aim at being more ahead of time also. So you could run it still JIT. So you could still run it through a browser, but you have that option to run it through an AOT as well, which is really interesting. All right. So you could do both. So it's optional typing. 
You could static or dynamic, and it's optional JIT or AOT. Now, what is Flutter specifically? We've talked about all the background here. What is Flutter? Well, Flutter, it's the framework using Dart and AOT compilation, okay? It was used to create to deploy on mobile platforms. Remember, iOS wouldn't allow for JIT, so therefore, they had to do an AOT. And it's just a simple, a simple way of creating applications very quickly. Um, because it provides it framework, it provides the support for you. We'll go over this. It seems very simple and straightforward. Not trivial. I'm not going to go that far. You still have to know a little bit of stuff here, unfortunately. But it's, it's, it simplifies it quite a bit. Sometimes a lot of code is very redundant. You have to do this and this and this. Make sure check this with this. Many times these frameworks do it for you. There is, um, I'm going to throw out something, a potential for desktop applications. So like I said, it's t used, Flutter is used for targeting Android and iOS. Dart itself through Angular or even just vanilla Dart um, is for the web programming. But it, um, you could potentially in the future use desktop apps for Fuchsia OS. Now, Fuchsia OS isn't really an OS right now. Well, it's an OS. It's not a used o operating system at this point in time. But it's a completely new operating system built from the ground up um, that Google is actually working on. And it is using Flutter to create the user interface as well as some applications as well. So in the future, because it doesn't really exist in a great degree right now, we don't know, but it should not be difficult to get a mobile application and convert it into a desktop application as long as the desktop is going to be Fuchsia OS. There's no reason you can't get, get a Flutter and port it to, I don't know, Windows or something like that. I, they're not working on that, so you'd have to do it yourself, so it's not really a doable thing. But to do something on Fuchsia OS, it certainly is possible. My take, if you're already familiar with Fuchsia OS, it, my, my personal take on Fuchsia OS there, um, a lot of people are saying, what are their plans for that and stuff like that. I personally believe they don't have plans for it. it. It's kind of one of those things that you cannot just plan on saying, let's build something and plan for it in the future and Put all the resources into something like that. What you basically have to do is you have to make it and see how it works. And, and you have to be flexible in saying in a couple of years from now, oh, this is good enough to actually port things. Or you have to be able to say, boy, this thing is just not working out. What else can we do with something like this? Can we use this for something else? Maybe an internet of things or maybe something, maybe a Mo if not mobile phone, maybe desktop or what can we do with something like this? I think all they're really doing is building the framework for it's just like no, it's no different from flutter and it's no different from um uh, dart it's they're not exactly sure what people are going to do with this so they're not exactly sure what they are going to do with it so i don't think there's any mastermind behind fuchsia os that's my personal take i'm the foggiest idea of, of the reality but i i don't think i think they're just making it doing the best they can and maybe it'll be replacing everything but with the understanding that it may replace nothing all right Lastly, my personal commentary, okay? So this is kind of the background itself. Not much opinion, of my, my opinion here, other than what I mentioned of the Fuchsia OS. But this is just my opinion for what it's worth. Flutter, t it, to me, is, seems to be a very ambitious project, okay? So it is very interesting. Um, we went from a web language, and they changed it quite a bit almost 180 degrees to make it more of a targeted for mobile devices. Um, and that is very difficult to do. I'm not sure technically if it's that difficult. I mean, you can do it. Any language could. But the social implications behind that, getting all these people together and saying, okay, let's make some big, huge changes and move the language forward, must have been very difficult to do. Now, when you think about what other language does that, what other language can do that, is is both this type um, uh, JIT as well as AOT has it can be used for web, for client, for desktop. That flexibility, I don't know, is another language itself. Yes, you could probably get Python, and I'm sure there are some ways of putting it on the web and stuff like that, but. Those are kind of like those fringe things. It's not the main organization or a major group of, of developers coming together to create something like this. But again, I'm not making any qualifying statements because this is the top-down organization versus the grassroots phenomena, right? So 
If you're talking about grassroots people, like the, the, the users themselves making this framework, it's going to probably start with a very, very sp small framework and build up from there. All right. As opposed to a top down organization, we have a company like Google that says, this is what we're going to do. Let's put people together itself. That's a whole lot easier to get stuff done as opposed to the grassroots let's just get one or two people together and maybe more people will join into the group so whatever model is better i'm not saying i really don't know but that is the difference so if somebody's going to say well the only reason why dart can do this javascript can't do any of this is because it's controlled by one organization i'll 100 percent admit that that is completely true but again, it just shows, even then, it shows at least that the creators of Dart are very flexible in how they're thinking and how they're evolving with the times. They're not just set like this. There are some languages where this is the way it is. We have no intention of expanding it. We have no desire to do anything else. This is the way it is. So there, there are like that, and they have these you know, leaders um, in, in those groups don't want to change the language at all but this just shows some of the philosophy behind the dart again whether you think dart should expand to others or not i'll leave that up to you i think it's a good thing you're you're welcome to your own opinion on that one too so in here for developers i'm not really a dart developer i'm just a hobbyist here okay so but if you're a dart developer it gives you major opportunities here you can use the web you could program for the server mobile and potentially for desktop in the future assuming future os goes through or if somebody ports flutter onto other desktops so it's really really a powerful language um not many people use it so that's a disadvantage right but at least the language in and of itself is really potentially very very powerful okay so in the next video let's actually install flutter and let's keep going from there okay thanks